is loud on the other side of the glass. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. Today is Sunday, February 10th, 2019. I'm your host, Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Dom Baker. Hey, good to be here. And uh, thank you for filling in. We realize that on the schedule, uh, Jen was supposed to be on there. Unfortunately, she's ill. And so today we're going to get a failure. Yes. Oh, hooray. Uh, a couple announcements to get out of the way first. Um, yeah. So here we are. It's, uh, it's live TV. It's, um, you know, something we do all over the internet just cause... You know, it's a show that we do. People call in, tell us what they believe and why. We either agree with them or disagree with them and then talk about it. And, you know, that's, that's kind of it. Yeah. No, nothing. Pretty simple thing. Yeah. No big deal. <laughs> Except it's the best thing ever. <laughs> it's my favorite thing to do. Um, and, and I have a lot of things that I would put near the you know top of the favorite thing, but coming in here and actually well, we're, doing we're, this is... We're a big deal in that we're the kind of longest running show doing that. Oh, yeah. scary. Yeah. 20 some odd years and, and next month will be 15 years, I think, that I've done this. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, we're getting old, Matt. <laughs> it's all right. I'm fine with that. Uh, so announcements-wise, you know, the, this show is sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. We are here at the Free Thought Library, 1507 West Koenig Lane. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come down and join us. So if you're in Austin, Texas, for whatever reason, you can always come down and watch the show. And not just the show, the shows, because the ACA now produces nine different programs, uh, including Talk Heathen, which was on just a couple of hours ago. Uh, we are constantly building a bigger, brighter, stronger community here in the Austin area. This building is full. Uh, it's open seven days a week from 10 to 9. It is a proper library, but there's also other stuff going on. It's a, it's a real community center. And as such, there are a number of events we like to do. Uh, one of the shows that we've been producing is called Secular Sexuality, which is uh, it's on Thursdays, if I'm correct, or at least it's on this Thursday for sure. Uh, they had me on as a guest. I have no idea why, but you know, who knows? Maybe I'll come back and t talk more sexy stuff at a later point. But this Thursday is Valentine's Day. And as such... Uh, we wanted to do something a little special. So there's going to be a live episode of Secular Sexuality in a theater-type venue where before the show starts, we're going to have Shelley Siegel down, who you just heard her wonderful intro music, but she's going to come down, do a live performance before that. So it's a two-for-one event. You get, you get to go to a Shelley Siegel concert, and then you get an episode of Secular Sexuality. That is this Thursday, which is Valentine's Day. And I know some people are like, wait a minute. I already had plans for Valentine's Day. Change them. <laughs> it's Valentine's Day. Bring your date. Yeah. <laughs> Look, if you've got somebody that you care about that you love, what more could you do for them other than to bring them out for a good double billing show, a music concert, and a show on sex? If you come to Sexual Sexuality and want to get laid by your significant other and don't, that's on you. you you've, we've, we've laid all the groundwork. Everything's going to be there. There's going to be uh, drinks available and other stuff. But what we're going to do is this show is on from 4.30 to 6 p.m. And uh, that's central time. Normally we go a bit over. But we're now monitoring ticket sales for Thursday night's event. And I'm going to add one minute to the episode for each ticket sold during the time that we're on the air. So if you've been procrastinating and haven't actually got your ticket yet, you need to do it. You need to do it quickly because who knows when they're going to run out. But we'll extend the show uh, and go a little longer based on what we sell. And if we sell no tickets, if you guys, if you guys fail 
to help me make this event a success. Don and I are leaving right at 6. We're going to have food. <laughs> Screw you guys. You have to wait a whole other week before you get an episode with us on there. So there we go. Uh, they're going to keep me posted on ticket sales. And, but And how, how, how would people get those tickets, man? Well, that's the interesting thing. At the bottom of your screen right now, if you're looking at it, it it's bit.ly slash secular sexuality. The link is also in the description for the video. The monitors of the Super Chat are going to be posting in there on occasion. You can also go to Eventbrite and do a Google search or do a search on Eventbrite for secular sexuality. There's countless ways to find this. It only took me a couple seconds, but there's a link there uh, right at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Get your tickets. Come on down. If you don't have a significant other, you don't have to buy two tickets, but you could. <laughs> um, I will be there. I have no significant other that, you know, is coming with me to this thing, so I'll, I'll be there and single. <laughs> and, <laughs> if, if that makes you not want to buy a ticket, if you buy enough tickets, I'll stay home. <laughs> Buy enough tickets, Matt won't even show up. But anyway, uh, we're really looking forward to the event. Love uh, them or hate them, either way it's a win. Right? Yeah. I, I'll do what, <laughs> I, I will do whatever I need to do to sell out this show, okay. including staying home. All right. But uh, no, we're, we're excited about this and all the other things the AC is doing. And most of it is because of the viewers and listeners uh, who tune in every week, those who support on Patreon, those who come down to the studio and cheer raucously from the other side of the glass. Uh, and won't you have Shelly on as a guest on this show? Yes. Okay. Oh. So Shelly's actually coming down, uh, staying with me, and we're going to practice some guitar stuff because I don't play often enough uh, to, for it to matter. Then Thursday night will be the show. Uh, Friday night, uh, some of us are going to the 10 o'clock Esther's Folly show, which uh, I'm sure thing. people have heard me talk about how it's my favorite thing in Austin that's not this. Um, and then Sunday, I'll be on the show with Shelly, and uh, we're, there's talk about possibly doing the intro song live. Wow. We can't guarantee that yet because there's some, <laughs> you know, I suck and there's some technical issues to solve. But Wow. Yeah, so we're, we're planning cool. up for a really fun weekend for Valentine's Day. So if you've got somebody and you don't have something to do, come do this. If you already have something to do, cancel it and come do this. If you don't have somebody, come do this. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, on that note, before we get to callers, Don is here filling in and we have a failure to discuss. We have a failure. Awesome. Well... Over the years, we, we've talked uh, about various Christian celebrities, I'll put that in air quotes, and their impact on the world. And this is, uh, today I've got just got 10, 10 folks, I'm going to hit each one very briefly and talk about where are they now? What, you know, what's happened to them? I mean, these are all folks that we've talked about on the show over the years. And has the continued wonder-working power of religion improved these folks you you be the you if be I, if the I know where they are now, am I supposed to say where they are now? Well, if you have any comments or insights into them, that feel free to chime in. Sweet. Okay, Peter Popoff. Ah, yes, Peter Popoff is back and almost as big as ever. Shockingly enough. Yes. So in the '80s, he ran a faith healing scam that was exposed by James Randi on national television. It's kind of helped help make James Randi famous, I think. And got Johnny Carson to curse on live. Oh, on, okay. and they are live. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they were they were uh, getting uh, messages from the Holy Spirit supposedly, and and uh, calling on individual people. And uh, James Randi figured out they were they had earpieces and and mics, and the and the wife was actually reading from cards that people signed when they came in. And anyway, it was, okay, PD, <laughs> if you're not ready, you're in real trouble. Yes. go watch the clip; it's on YouTube. But watch it after this show. Yes. Uh, now he's he's uh, got a late night TV scam. He's marketing blessed water to the gullible, and uh, and what he's really wanting is people to call in and give their telephone numbers to them uh, for for people who are desperate and need a boost from God of some sort. And yeah. I presume he's going to you know squeeze them for money. Um, if I had to guess, but yes, if there's if they're giving you it. something <laughs> for free or cheap, be prepared for the upsell. Right, which is you can afford this blessed water, which will help you, but we've got a bucket of blessed goop <laughs> that we sell for a hundred and fifty dollars an ounce, and it's invisible, and it's <laughs> it it will make you live as long as God wants you to live. <laughs> yeah. So he's still scamming. Okay, Pat Robertson. Uh, there's a lot True to say story. about him. Um, 
He uh, is took over the Christian Broadcast Network and became a very visible t uh, televangelist. He had an unsuccessful run for presidency in, in 1988. Yep. He is flame, famous in my mind for blaming the victims of weather-related disasters. I think we should just coin that as a new word, flamous. Flamist? Yeah. <laughs> flamous. He got flamous for being a flaming asshole. He's had various fun and interesting business deals involving blood diamonds and waste, weight loss shakes or protein shakes. And he has five failed prophecies. <laughs> <laughs> At least. At least, right. And where is he now? Well, he's still crazy after all these years. He's uh, he's he's fading out. He, I don't think he'll be with us that much longer. Uh, one of his quotes is, Feminiz Feminism is a socialist, anti-family political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, and destroy capitalism and become lesbians. As if those were bad things. <laughs> That's too too funny. Yeah, so uh, not remotely true, and not necessarily a bad thing. And recently, he was in the news for yes, blaming blaming a victim for for her her cancer or whatever whatever illness she had. Okay, great guy, Ken Ham. <clears throat> I can tell you exactly where he is right now. <laughs> the American Atheist National Convention is on Easter weekend, and it's going to be in. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, I believe? Yeah. Or Cincinnati, Ohio. You don't quote me. Just go to atheist.org and look it up yourself. Uh, I'll be there. But at the same time that the American atheists are having their convention, why? Ken Ham and Ray Comfort decided that they should put on a convention not too far away uh, to kind of compete. <laughs> now... <laughs> He's on my list, too. <laughs> the, whole, the whole reason that the American Atheist Convention is on Easter, or one of the many reasons, is not just that it's kind of an amusement that we're doing this on a holiday that Christians stole from pagans, uh, but also because uh, it's not a holiday we would celebrate or care about, and yet people tend to have that weekend off. Well, you get cheaper cheaper uh, exactly. and things. Exactly, right? because Christians, uh, by and large, will go to church and then hunt Easter eggs, and that's it. That's their day. So I think they've made a mistake trying to book uh, a convention alongside that on Easter weekend because that's for normal Christian families that's where they spend with their families they go to church and then they do the family right. thing we'll see there aren't conventions on Christmas by the way yeah, that would be a big mistake yeah okay well he's a, a hardcore young earth creationist uh, he's pumped out a lot of creationist drivel over the years he had a debate with uh, Bill Nye uh, in 2014, that he and where he argued the past is unknowable to science, and therefore his holy book should fill that gap. And the event uh, brought a lot of media attention to his creationist museum, even though yep. a lot of folks think that Bill Nye won the debate. Everybody except for Ken Ham believes that Bill Nye won that debate. Yeah, right. Uh, lately, he's been uh, scamming Kentucky out of tax incentives for his failing Ark Park. Noah's Ark Park, and it's been losing money and not coming through with the promised job creation and embroiled in one scandal after another. I think there's maybe 20 scandals associated with it at this point. By the way, uh, I put out a challenge the other day. Um, if Ken Hammond and Ray Comfort would like to have me speak at their convention, I would be happy to do so. Okay. I'll be in the area. I won't charge you a penny. You can plot me on stage and have people ask me questions uh, until you're tired of me. But I, I, I'll make I'll take one for the team and do that. Wow, what an offer! Somehow I don't think they'll take you up on it. Yeah, which is which is going to be a little bit of hypocrisy because Ray Comfort was asked and allowed to speak at an American Atheist convention one time. There you go. <laughs> so your move, okay. creationists. <laughs> Speaking of creationist, uh, Kent Hovind. Mm, I, I know he's out of prison now. <laughs> he's out of prison. That's kind of the punchline. Uh, uh, he's a goofy young earth creationist. Uh, he Dr. Dino. Dr. Dino uh, ran Dinosaur Adventureland, had a fake uh, $25,000 prize for anyone who could prove evolution. Yeah. He got his uh, PhD mail order. And he's been criticized by Answers in Genesis as using bad and outdated I think his, arguments. I think his PhD was from something like Patriot University or something. Yeah, that sounds right. It was a trailer out in the middle of nowhere that's not accredited. There's pictures of it, and you can find his thesis as yeah. well if you do a quick oh, it's, Google it's search. Oh, it's a good laugh. Yeah. It's worth doing, yeah. So as, as Matt said, he's recently out of jail for uh, his tax tax evasion. Yeah, and I don't want to beat him up too much for that stuff because it's it's not relevant to his ministry, apart from the fact that he seemed to think that uh, 
because of his relationship with God and the, and the work that he was doing, that he was not on the same playing field as everybody else. So, <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, uh, he's he's it, had a it's falling really sad out when they believe their own stuff, right? <laughs> he's had a falling out with his son, divorced his wife, and married his mistress. So you know, oh, fun. hey, I maintain that. that moral high ground there, Kent. <laughs> Yeah, he's probably one of the slimiest ones on my list here. Uh, Michael Behe's next. Um, ah, he just published a new book. Oh, he did? Yeah, like within the last week or so, people oh. have been ripping it to shreds. Oh, no. Well, he's a scientist, author, and intelligent design proponent. Uh, he promoted the idea of irreducible complexity and gave several examples and challenges, all of which have been refuted by now. Including uh, including refuted by other Christians in the dover Kitzmiller Miller drive, yep. trial. Yep. Yeah, he was he uh, that famous case. He was kind of a um, a big player in the Kiltzmiller versus Dover case, and uh, where ID was found to be a repackaging of creationism. Um, Her design proponents. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, he's also been shunned by his fellow professors at Lehigh University. So he's a little bit of a pariah there. So, uh, uh, but he has a new book, huh? Do you yes. know the title? Uh, I don't know the title off the top of my head. It's something about the new DNA evidence that disproves evolution or something along, along those lines. Oh, okay. Uh, it's more, a, it, more of the same, huh? The reviews, I, and I read, haven't read the book, but the reviews I've read have basically said that he's going through and uh, cherry-picking essentially things that are problematic and ignoring the responses from proper scientists. Um, I think Jerry Coyne had a blog post about it the other day. Okay. All right. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth uh, Ratzinger. Yeah. So he was an um, uh, he had an ambitious rise to power within the Catholic hierarchy, but despite being a Hitler Youth uh, as prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, formerly known as the Roman Inquisition, he had inside knowledge of. That's priests. one you should expect. Yeah. He had inside uh, knowledge of all priest scandals and very likely covered up a few. He was sued uh, and and tried to be, and some folks tried to bring him to trial in the U.S. in 2005, but he claimed dip, diplomatic immunity, and later stepped down as pope, which is very very unusual. Usually yeah. they they die. I think that hasn't happened in 600 years, and now he lives in the Vatican under under a rock or whatever with all the other folks that are hiding out there from from legal legal <laughs> legal authorities. And Tim Minchin wrote a song about him. So and that's probably the best thing that happened during Ratzinger's reign was Tim Minchin wrote the Pope song, which you should also watch after this show is over. Okay, lots of good stuff. Um, Ted Haggard, another inspired completely of a heterosexual. Song. Right. He ins- he inspired a Roy Zimmerman classic. Yes he I, did. I highly recommend you watch. <laughs> He's a, he was a Colorado Springs minister. He still is. He was president of the National Association of Evangelicals and was considered one of the most influential evangelical ministers. But he liked meth and yeah. rent boys. Yes, meth and rent boys. Uh, so uh, his, his hypocrisy um, was exposed because he's been speaking out against same-sex marriage and, and that sort of thing. And um, after a high-profile prayer intervention uh, among his peers, he's back ministering again in Colorado Springs. I think these folks really don't have any other job skills, which is kind of sad. Um, yeah, I feel I feel more sad for the for the individuals who have signed up and are part of the clergy project, because a lot of them are stuck in jobs that they they really can't get out of because they don't have any other skill base. They've been preaching for 20, 25, 30 years, and uh, it makes me wonder how many of these that. You know, get busted for some crime or some you know moral dilemma, and then they're back in the pulpit. Is it because that they don't have any? They don't know how to do anything else. They don't have any other options. Or is it because they actually sincerely believe? And I think it's going to depend on the individual. It's six of one, half dozen of the other. Yep, yep. Uh, Ray Comfort. Um, we mentioned him briefly. He's an evangelical minister. He's uh, founded the Living Waters Ministry and the Way of the Master organization. He's published tracks that look like money and... <laughs> and got it taken to, away. Yeah, try to... Anyway, um, he's teamed up with actor Kurt Cameron on various media projects. Who's a misogynist piece of shit? <laughs> oh, yeah, he's, he's kind of bad news. Uh, he had a failed bananas or atheist nightmare argument. Which is now part of my traveling magic and skepticism show. <laughs> is it? Okay, good. <laughs> it's the first thing. He had a failed are you a good person apologetic? He... Uh, Wait... <laughs> Wait. 
So to say that Ray Comfort had a failed are you a good person apologetic is kind of like, uh, I mean, that's one of 20,000 failed apologetics. Yep. Why did you pick that one? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just find it very annoying. Uh, it's, it's amusing. <laughs> uh, it's annoying. <laughs> uh, he was exposed for that uh, years ago on the Hellbound Alley show uh, because he'd say, you know, well, you know, are you a good person? I'm not going to get the accent right. Sorry. <laughs> Have you ever told a lie? Well, what does that make you? It makes you a liar. And they, they said, Ray, have you ever told the truth? And he's like, oh, good one. Yeah. <laughs> How is it you can do this apologetic? Have you ever told a lie for years and never think about the possibility that I've also told the truth? Yep, yep. So that's, that's a bad one. Uh, he also issued a, 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 a reissued the origin of the species claiming that it was unmodified but had many chapters missing. <laughs> Did it. Yes. Because I thought that all that happened was he published it in, in its entirety with his That's what he claimed. thing on the front. Okay, yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't go through it because I didn't need to read his <laughs> introduction to the origin of species. Uh, yeah. So lately he, had, he did a new video called The Atheist Delusion. Mm. I wonder where that title came from. I'm, I'm sure Richard's not going to sue him. <laughs> he argues that DNA is like a book. Books can't copy themselves. Gee whiz, DNA is amazing. Therefore, God exists. Yeah, except that one of the areas in which DNA is not like a book is that DNA can copy itself. <laughs> That's right. So your analogy falls apart at the very first sentence. That's right. DNA is like a book, except that it can copy itself, and it's not made of words. <laughs> yeah, right. Or paper. So think uh, reproduction and cell division. Okay. Uh, Harold Camping. Ah, uh, I know where he is. <laughs> He's dead. He's dead, right. So he was a small-time wackadoodle minister predicting the end of the world twice. Re repeatedly. <laughs> repeatedly, yes. So he's, he was a proven fraud demonstrating via his followers that, followers that a fool and his money are soon parted. The fool and his money were lucky to get together in the first place. <laughs> right. To, to go with a Harry Anderson He died quote. in 2013, and the world is still going just fine. It's funny because the nice thing about Harold Camping is that uh, he the last rapture that he had, which was May 5th, 2011, 2012, something like that, um, we, he, he was out in the Oakland, California area. So I flew out to the American Atheist, put on what was called the Oakland Rapture Ram, and Ram was regional atheist meetup. Mm -hmm. And so it was like a mini convention there in Oakland. Uh, and I was there with a, a great many awesome people. Greta Christina and I pulled out the blow dryer and did deep baptisms wearing robes. <laughs> um, uh, Keith Ol Jensen was there. Uh, that's where he and I, he and I first met. Um, Mr. Deity was there as well. And the funny thing is, is that in the e I evening, uh, in one of the later talks, I think it was right in the middle of, of Brian's Mr. Deity talk, uh, there was an earthquake. So here we are on Rapture Day. <laughs> and we're gathered here, and there's an earthquake. And it was one that you could actually feel that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, hey, was that an earthquake? It was like, oh, wow, that There's was an earthquake. An earthquake. <laughs> yeah. Not terrifying, nothing, you know, fell down or broke, but it was, it was enough. And I'm not going to do Keith joke because I, I don't steal jokes. And it's funny. You should listen to Keith talk about it. But people are, got quiet and it's looking around. And that's when I yelled, is that the best you got? <laughs> and then we went on with the convention. And then Harold Camping died. So, yeah. Okay. Good story. Good story. Then there was this Jesus character. He, he was uh, raving about the end of the world and delusions of grandeur. Maybe. And uh, he said he'd return and, make, and made pr predictions about the timing, but uh, those predictions are a failure. Uh, they didn't happen. And he's still dead, and he's been a frost prophet for 2,000-plus years. If he ever existed, he's, as far as we can tell, he's not alive. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. So many of these famous Christians are just as oily as they ever were. Uh, even when their frauds, frauds are exposed, they keep going, like the Energizer Bunny. Uh, and there's no real power within Christianity to clean up the, themselves or these frauds, so they persist. And ultimately, the belief is a fraud, and, the, and many of the people that promote it are working a scam. And these people are not going to lead you to eternal salvation, but uh, they're just or eternal bliss. They're just playing, preying on your ignorance, and that's another failure of Christianity. It's an interesting uh, take on, on all of this because, you know, there's other names you could have picked out. 
Um, yeah, there's a much larger list. But yes. the thing that I find interesting is, you know, here's Peter Popoff who's exposed as a fraud on live TV in a, in a shocking way and ends up, I think, bankrupt, at least temporarily, and is now back making millions of dollars a year with yet another scam. The same thing happened with Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, with Jimmy Swaggart and his, oh, no, let me cry and tell you how sad I was to have sex here. with those women. And, and yeah, yeah you, you weren't sad to have sex. Sorry, that's a big fat lie. Uh, and yet, he, you know, he's back. It's, they're like cockroaches <laughs> in the sense that they're really, really difficult to get rid of. But it's not for lack of trying. It's the fact that a huge portion of the population evidently loves a cockroach that they think can still benefit them in some way. Yeah. Tell them something they don't know. And, you know, if, if it's all about forgiveness, then you should forgive these people for the scams that they did in the past so that they can scam you again. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an embarrassing, embarrassing kind of uh, sad look at the world that, you know, fool me once... Fool me twice, fool me three times, fool me every Sunday at midnight as I buy your little bits of oil. Uh, I can't even hardly blame these guys that they have found an audience that is so gullible that much like another figure that I won't mention, they seem to be able to get away with pretty much anything and maintain their position of power and authority over others. Yep. Uh, that doesn't happen uh, so much in, in other venues. Uh, at least for the most part, the secular humanist community has been really good about making sure that, you know, hey, if this person's terrible and doing bad things to our community, they're not going to be welcome at our events anymore, let alone hold a position of leadership. Not always true, but sometimes. There we go. There we go. Let's take some calls. Another fail. Yes, we got calls and... Um, well, we haven't done this in a bit, but we have Nikolai in Iceland. How are you? Hello. I, it's, I'm told here that you believe in Thor. Yeah. I don't know exactly what you mean, so if you can tell us what it is that you uh, believe okay. and why. All right, first of all, I'm so very thankful for you taking my call. I'm a big fan of the show. Oh, thanks. Okay. Um, so, basically, I'm pretty sure that... I might have found the conclusion that Thor is real. Okay. Um, okay. So, if you think about it, we've all observed hammers in real life. We have all observed really strong men with beards and long hair. Just to make sure we're all uh, agreeing here. We have, right? I've seen a hammer and I've seen really strong men with long hair. All right. We've observed lightning. We've seen movies and comics about him. That's documentation in a way. He has problems to deal with, so he's not a perfect, uh, super strong, supernatural god. Most people cannot easily lift big hammers, so that says something. Most people with hammers are dangerous when angry. <laughs> people can fly in this day and age, uh, airplanes. And uh, elevators are like the modern-day portal, if you think about it. <laughs> So I don't really know how you could not believe in it. I, I'm sold. Me too. <laughs> well, <laughs> sure. I Thanks a lot for calling. To, I didn't expect it to go this fast, but all right. That's because I don't remotely think you're serious. So I, I just played along. Oh, okay. I am serious. You, you're serious. You think that because there are hammers and strong men, that therefore there's Thor. Uh. When you put it like that, it seems very stupid. You bet. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, so I, I've seen robotic suits. Does that mean there's Iron Man too? Well, no. Okay. Uh, but, but also, you know, uh, I mean, Iron Man, Batman, these are just like, you know, self-made dudes and not gods. But, um, yeah, but they're, couldn't they're, we... Um, they're um, couldn't, man-made creations, though. I, I've, seen, I've seen crosses... Does that mean Jesus is real and God? Uh, no, of course not. Yeah. So the fact that there's a hammer and there are heavy hammers and it takes a strong person to lift a heavy hammer doesn't mean that there's a Thor. Well, I still disagree. 
because I, uh, I, I, I feel him every day in my heart. I, 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 I apologize. I don't believe you. Uh, and so we'll move on. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that's an, an obvious bullshit call because I'm not aware of anything in the Thor mythos where you would feel him in your heart. <laughs> Until he drives Stormbringer directly into it, and you happen to be Thanos, and then you would kind of maybe feel <laughs> Thor's axe in your heart. But I think the comic books have polluted the original mythology. <laughs> yeah, I you know, it's like oh, I, I I almost commented on the fact that you know we've seen men with long hair, yeah, up until Ragnarok, <laughs> and then all of a sudden he had short hair. So you know, yeah, there's something wrong there. You know, pretty soon <laughs> Thor will look like me and be very unimpressive. <laughs> I've got a hammer. It's just a matter of a few years, right? Now. <laughs> I've got a hammer. I have very, very, very short hair. I am Thor in twenty years. <laughs> Let's uh, take another call. <laughs> yeah, we've got uh, Andrew in Twinsburg wants to talk about the historical reliability of the Gospels. Hey, how you doing, Matt? How you doing, Don? Hi, pretty good. Uh, last time we talked, Matt, we talked about the ending of Mark. Yeah, Mark 16, 9 through 20. Yeah, that was added. I don't remember what, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, we're in agreement then that that was added. Yeah, because there's 12 words in that that weren't included in the uh, Mark's gospel. Well, the, in, the, in the oldest, yeah, the, from verses 9 through 20 don't exist in the oldest and best manuscripts for the gospel of Mark. Here's the thing. Uh, it's in the Bible. It's in pretty much every published Bible that you're going to find. Some of them will add a little note saying, uh, I, think, I think the NIV adds a note that uh, the following verses do not exist in the oldest and best manuscripts of Mark, but are included here for completeness due to tradition or something along those lines. Um, but what's included in those 9 through 20 is some really outlandish stuff, like not just you know, a, a version of the Great yeah, the, Commission. The snakes and all that. Yeah, they, yeah, you can drink poison and you can handle venomous snakes and all that stuff. So that's in pretty much, pick, a, pick any Christian and open their Bible, you will find those verses there, correct? But there's always a footnote that says this was probably added. Well, there's not always a footnote, okay? Uh, in every Bible, I have three and it always says it in mine. Okay, well, I, I should have brought my... King James that I grew up with at home because it doesn't say that and it's got a concordance and everything. But why would we include such ridiculous passages that even Christian scholars acknowledge don't exist in the oldest manuscripts? So there's not good reason to think that this is an instruction from God. Doesn't that only serve to confuse? And doesn't that also violate other scriptures about not adding to or taking away? And yet, I, I don't know that I've ever heard or heard of any Christian preacher giving a Sunday on ser uh, a sermon on Sunday morning that starts with, hey, Mark 16, open your Bibles. Every verse from 9 through 20, just ignore those because that's stuff that was added and is not Scripture. I've never heard that. Well, that's, that's why we have so many manuscripts so we can see which, what was added, what was not. Because there's also a phrase in 1 John 5, 7 that's called uh, comma euhanium. Yeah. And that one's, uh, that one's controversial as well. Yes. And so the thing is, as we go through these, so the comma johanium is essentially where, this is where the Trinity is, the only spot where the Trinity is kind of expressly uh, presented in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, in that sense. That may not be accurate, but the... Trinity was invented basically in 325 CE. Uh, but, so now we've got at least two things in two Gospels that are at best dubious. How many other things are in the Bible that people take as the Word of God that aren't? And how can you tell? Well, there's another one too. <laughs> yeah. The uh, woman in adultery. Yep. Yeah. But an early church father quotes that, I think, around 100 A.D. So I think they just put it in the wrong place or something. That's what I was taught. It might be the case. Here's the thing. If all of those things were supposed to be in there, if, if even the ending of Mark uh, existed in an original manuscript, that doesn't change whether or not it's true or believable or anything else. But what we find is that as we begin to investigate, we find more and more problems. And so this becomes an issue 
for anybody who wants to say that the Bible is the inspired word of God and all scripture, scripture is useful for instruction if in fact there are passages in the Bible that shouldn't be there. What if there are also passages that should be there? Like the Shepherd of Hermas or uh, the Apocalypse of Peter, which were both considered uh, inspired scripture. They just didn't make it into the canon. So when we start talking about the Bible and how reliable it is, um, it's not... And I don't know how you could ever get to the point where you have, we have no original manuscripts. We don't know who, who wrote a good chunk of it. There's disputed authorship for other things. And God hasn't come out with the, the here's the 2019 edition of the New Testament with corrections and addendum. And it would seem to me that if I was God and I had inspired a message for all of humanity that was the most important message ever, and they clearly got some of it wrong, I, sh I have a responsibility to correct that. So the fact that the correction hasn't come either means that uh, it's not wrong, God doesn't care, or God doesn't exist. Well, the Maritor the it's called the Maritoran Fragment, and we just got around yeah. 180. Yeah. And that's got 22 of the 27 books. Sure. Well, I know in the book of Jude, Timothy, and I think the, one of the epistles of Peter, they talk about false teaching in the church. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because one of the things that's attributed to Paul is clearly a forgery. And it's funny because the passages in, in those books talk about, you know, I, Paul, write to you by my own hand so that you will know that it is me, which is basically there's people running around forging my stuff. This is not a forgery, which, by the way, is exactly what a forger would write. <laughs> Well, when we look at the book of Hebrews, we still have no idea who wrote that, but I think it was probably Barnabas and Paul wrote that together. Okay. Who, and and the thing is... Christian, who did you think? Who did you think wrote that? When I was a Christian, I didn't spend that much time worrying about who wrote it because it was inspired by God. It didn't matter to me that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John weren't written by anybody named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What mattered was that this is what God inspired as the gospel story, and I was supposed to garner from it the elements that were relevant to, to my walk and not be concerned at all about who wrote it. It's only after I started finding my way out that I discovered that the people I'd assumed wrote it hadn't, and that the things that I assumed were eyewitness testimony weren't. Um, and also that even if they were eyewitness testimony and were written by the people that I thought wrote them, that still doesn't tell me whether or not what they wrote is accurate. So I, I, well, I'm, really looking, I'm, I'm really looking for a way that we can figure out exactly which parts of the Bible are accurate and how we can tell. Well, I think Mark... The Last Supper was at Mark's house. Do you want to? Do you want me to explain? I don't care whose house it is. I don't know how is it relevant whose house it is. Because he, Mark puts himself into the gospel. Yeah, so what I'm He's saying, the naked man that wrote Mark, John Mark. Okay, whoever wrote Mark inserted himself in there, and you think that the Last Supper happened at his place? Cool. Yes. What? Well, because in Acts 12, Peter goes to that house after he escapes prison. Yeah. What difference does it make whose house it was at? Well, if Mark and Barnabas are cousins, and if he wrote Hebrews, then we're putting all this stuff together. Okay. I, I think what Matt's getting at is is you you got to take a step back and ask. You did know, this happen? Yeah. Did this happen? You know, what, what, is there anything of value here? It makes no difference to me where the Last Supper was, or. It really doesn't matter to me too much if the Last Supper occur occurred. I could, I could say, okay, I'm going to grant you that Jesus was a real person, uh, Yeshua ben Joseph, and some people who we don't really know that much about wrote some things about his life. Some of them kind of almost tried to look like eyewitnesses, even though the evidence is against them being written by eyewitnesses. Um, but let's say that everything about those um, was accurate in the sense that, yep, there was a Last Supper, and we have a pretty good recording of what was actually said there, none of that gets us in any way closer to whether or not Jesus was in fact God incarnate uh, and whether or not he died and was resurrected and whether or not that applies for the salvation of sins and whether or not uh, we know at all what we need to do um, to 
fill our our role, what God wants our role to be. So we're we're sitting here talking about acknowledging that there are problems with the books, and that goes down to authorship and reliability and what's in there. Um, and the first question that needs to happen is, how do we come to the conclusion that there's some truth to be found within this? Because I don't know that it's necessarily the case that there is any truth to be found within it, or that it's possible for us to figure out what's true and separate that from what's not true. Well, there's a lot of evidence. We could start with the massacre of the innocents. You don't believe that happened. Is it reported anywhere other than the Bible? Well, the Roman Emperor Augustus said that it is better to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. How does, that from, how does that attest to the slaughter of the innocents? Because only it was less than 20 that were slaughtered because Bethlehem was a small city. And that... Oh, no, 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 that doesn't... Okay, what does God need with the starship? That's a quote from Captain James T. Kirk. We can confirm he, he killed his uh, wife and a couple of his kids. Okay, that... Wow. You're you're awfully close to this material, and I think I think it would benefit you to take a step or two back. Well, when we look, I believe the Gospel of Matthew was written first. Well, you're you you are now in direct opposition with the overwhelming majority of scholars, including Christian scholars who spent their life studying this. Well, when you look at the uh, Gospel of Mark, he doesn't include Jesus' dad Joseph. Correct. Or I think I, I'm going to go with correct because I don't have it in front of me now, and and I don't have every bit of this all memorized anymore. But the vast you, you would at least acknowledge the vast majority of scholars, including Christian scholars who have studied the New, Test New Testament, uh, almost universally note that Mark was written first, and that Matthew and Luke either borrowed from Mark or borrowed from a shared source Q or something else, uh, because they include the same elements in in the same. Uh, in some cases, the same language and, and order. What makes you think that Matthew was written first? Because we have more discourse, like the Sermon on the Mount. You comp compare that to the Sermon on the Plain in Luke. It's very descriptive because Matthew was a tax collector, and he was probably writing this stuff down. And he probably didn't write it in Greek first. I'm sure he wrote it either in Hebrew and Aramaic first. So now you've assumed that... Matthew was real, Matthew was a tax collector, Matthew was the author, Matthew was literate, Matthew accurately wrote stuff down first. That's a lot of assumptions. How do you demonstrate any of that? Well, uh, a tax collector would have to be fluent in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Latin, or Greek. Okay. He would definitely be fluent in Greek. But it's, it's known we don't know who the authors are, Yeah. right? So, so a book for whom we don't know the author, you've now concluded who the author was, Based on a bunch of assumptions, it had to be, and it that had it was to be written confidential, or th they were getting killed. Who was getting killed? Nero. We know thirty years after Jesus' death that they were being killed in Rome. Who? Who? The Christians. Okay. What does that tell us about whether or not Christianity is true? That it spread that far from the, the Middle East to Rome in that quick of a time. That doesn't tell us anything about whether or not it's true. That tells us about whether or not it was popular and whether or not it was persecuted. That's not about whether or not it was true. Well, that would mean Acts is true then because it's spreading. <laughs> okay, the whole of oh, the book of Acts, scenario. the whole... So, like, if I list 10 things right now, just off the top of my head, the sky is blue, I'm the best person on the planet... I'm magical and can change water to wine. Four is greater than two. There, I gave you two things that are clearly demonstrably true. Does that tell you anything about whether or not my other statements are true? It's not my job to... Uh, you're a methodolog methodological naturalist. It's not okay, first of all, your first stop. Methodological naturalism has absolutely nothing to do with the question I asked. Not one thing. I said if I listed a bunch of things and the fact that one or two of them were correct, that, that doesn't tell you whether or not the others are correct. That's, that's You're just, trying to say that the miracles were correct in the Bible. I'm trying to get you but to... You don't believe in miracles. You're a methodological naturalist. Wow. So 
this, this, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what I talk about when I, when I talk about religious ideas putting up roadblocks to good discussion. Because I have made no statement at all in this about whether or not miracles were possible or not. You said that because they were persecuted, that means Acts is correct. But Acts has a lot of claims. And one claim from a book does not mean other claims from a book are true. That's all I was trying to get to. All right, I'm sorry about that. So the fact that a claim in a book is true tells you nothing about whether other claims in the book are true, right? Well, we got a lot of books to, we got 66 books to confirm here. Well, we don't act, we actually have to go through them all. And there, it doesn't matter if you had 66 books, 666 books or one book. The fact that there's a true statement in a book does not tell you about whether or not the other statements are true, correct? Correct. Okay, so you don't get to say that Acts is true just because Acts includes a true statement. Each statement in Acts that you would like to use to make your case would need to be supported by evidence. Correct. Okay. But do, do we want to go back to why I think Matthew was written first? Does it matter which one was written first? Like, well, there, the three synoptics were written before 70 AD because Jesus predicted the temple. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, as a matter of fact, the bulk of scholarship places them after 70 AD in part because of the temple. Now, yes, they don't believe Jesus was the hypostatic union, truly, right. God, truly man, that he could predict that. Right. They, do, so they, 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 they don't necessarily to... believe that it was a prediction, but there's also not evidence that they were written prior to that. You, the only, the only reason that you want to place them prior to that is because now it looks like a prediction about the temple. You have no evidence. So, so here, let I me mean, make this as easy as possible. I'm a magician, like on stage, including mind reading, including the ability to make predictions. I can have a sealed prediction on stage and people in the audience can make seemingly random decisions and I will have predicted this. Now, it's nice that my prediction is in place beforehand, but we're talking about a short show here and as far as you know, there's a prediction that's in place that from the beginning of the show that shows what somebody's going to say. I've successfully predicted it. I do it every show. Does that tell you, does that mean that I actually knew ahead of time what was going to happen? How do we know I didn't change things? How do we know that I didn't uh, manipulate things in certain ways? So the mere fact that something appears to be a prediction does not mean that it's not actually a postdiction. And when we don't have copies and when we don't have evidence that, that these things were written prior to that, you don't get just, just get to assume that, oh, well, this was a prediction and it happened afterwards, which means it must have been written before because that's how magicians fool you. But in the book of Acts, uh, Paul's death is not mentioned and Peter's death is not mentioned. But James the Apostle's death is mentioned and that's confirmed by Josephus. I'm not sure what point you're trying to get to, because once again... The point is that we can confirm other things that are happening in the Bible. Right, and, and as you that. just acknowledged not five minutes ago, the fact that some things in a book may be true doesn't tell you whether or not other things in the book are true. And the thing that we're trying to get to is that Jesus was God incarnate. How do you prove that? He rose from the dead and we have... How do you know that? How do you know that Jesus rose from the dead? And by the way, how do you know that the only way for somebody to rise from the dead is if they are God incarnate? We have the... In Second Peter, he says, we do not we do not follow cleverly devised tales when we have known to his power and met coming of his majesty. Yeah, that's I basically wouldn't. saying, I'm not being foolish. I actually believe this. That doesn't tell you whether it's true either. So what evidence would you be looking for? I don't know. What, what evidence, what, let, let's say that the claim is someone was killed and then resurrected three days later, which by the way, the math doesn't work out on that anyway. Um, what evidence? Well, there are two, that, I think that, that was in Bart Ehrman's book or something I read. But there are two Passovers they celebrated or something. I, no, I have that's, to look into that. okay, but all right, I'm going to say that's bullshit, but it doesn't matter because the question is, what evidence would convince me that someone died and was resurrected? Well, first of all, we would need really good evidence that the person existed. Then we would need good evidence that they were killed and that they were in fact dead and examined by the best medical experts and had a, a trail of that. And then we would need 
evidence that they were actually no longer dead at a later time. Now, you can, you can sit here and say, okay, well, they didn't have video cameras back then. Well, whose fault is that? Why did God decide to come down and take human form and sacrifice himself to himself to create a loophole for rules that he invented only to be resurrected during a time when it is impossible for people to reliably chronicle the facts such that people in the future have good reason to believe that this person was raised from the dead. It's not the fault of reason or science that God decided to, it's like, it's like the, the alien abduction claims where they seem to just go out in the middle of nowhere and pick Jim Bob in his trailer in the woods with no video camera, no ability to record anything, and he's the one who gets the anal probe and his cows are molested. And then he has to look at the rest of us and go, well, why don't you believe? Because while you may have evidence firsthand that you may or may not view as reliable, nobody else does. All this is is a claim and a story. There's no physical evidence to support even Jesus' existence, let alone death and resurrection. And even if we granted all of that, that Jesus existed, died, and was resurrected, we're still left with the question, how did Jesus get resurrected? And you can't make a case that the only explanation is that he was God. So you, you're calling, Tacitus mentions the crucifixion. Was Tacitus there? No, but he's a no. good historian. He's going to get his sources. You, you're saying he's a bad historian? I, I'm, yes. I was, if Tacitus recorded this without sufficient evidence, then he was a bad historian. But ta- that's not what Tacitus did. What Tacitus essentially did is report what people believed to have happened. He didn't report that it happened. He reported, there are Christians and they believe this. I understand your And he recorded it a generation later. It would be like somebody today saying, hey, Elvis died and was resurrected. I heard this from all the people who saw Elvis alive and reported it to tabloids over the last 30 years. Is that a good foundation to start the religion of Elvis? Again, we could harmonize the Gospels. I no, you can't that. harmonize the Gospels. That, that is the challenge that's been sitting there for ages. The Gospels cannot be harmonized. Who was at the tomb when they got there? Depends on which version well, you read. A, the angel, that, that's easily explained. The two angels, there's one in Matthew, and then there are two in John. It was at a different time of day. Oh, it's at a different time of day. So even though they report that, you know, who, who arrived at the tomb? And was the stone already rolled away, or did it roll away when they get there? And was the tomb completely, exactly and was, I'm not done, Bible. I'm it's not done, small, I'm not even fucking close to done. Was it, where was the stone, was it rolled away or did it roll away when they get there? Who, what was in the tomb? Was the tomb empty as one gospel reports or was there an angel in the tomb? Who, who talked about it? Who went and told? And who, there is no harmonization for this. I, I apologize that I'm going to beat you up over this, but it's like, this is the one puzzle for which there has been a massive sticking point within Christianity and that you cannot harmonize the Easter accounts. There are too many inconsistencies. And what a lot of apologists will do is say, well, of course they're inconsistencies. They are different people relating different stories. And it's only the key elements that we care about. And the key elements are that Mary went to the tomb, Jesus wasn't there, Jesus met her outside, and she went and told people. The other details are the same as if, you know, four people saw a car accident and they're going to get minor details wrong. That's how what apologists have done because they have to acknowledge, if they actually try, that you cannot harmonize these accounts. So it's it's just a mistake on your part to say that you can. It would be much better to just say, yeah, okay, there's things in there we don't understand, but there's uniformity. They're all telling the same story that Jesus was dead and he was resurrected. And that gets us back to the question that I had. I have pictures from the National Enquirer of Elvis walking around supermarkets after he was dead. Is that sufficient evidence? No. Do we have any photos of Jesus walking around anywhere after he was supposedly dead? No. We have people who claim that they've seen Elvis, lots of them. Is that sufficient evidence? You're talking about before he died or after? After he died. That's, that's a tabloid magazine. Hey, okay. You're reading a tabloid holy book. According to your opinion. Yes. 
And you know what? If you had actual evidence that was better than what we have for Elvis, you would present the evidence and not just, well, Axe was right about this, or, well, the Gospels can be harmonized when they can't. You don't have evidence. And you've, you're acknowledging, I would say that there is vastly superior evidence for the resurrection of Elvis than there is for the resurrection of Jesus. If you think you have better resurrection for, uh, for Jesus than you do for Elvis, present it. We have, we have, can we just say, about, go back to Matthew. In, uh, the, which book do you think was first written in the New Testament? Mark. And, and then James, the epistles. No, I think... I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about the, the epistles. Do you think James was written first? I don't know. And you know what? I don't care because which one was written first doesn't get you to which one has the truth. And by the way, the fact that you're trying to find one that you can say was written first is a way to try to massage the truth. If a book was written first, does that mean it's true? If all 27 books describe Jesus, I'd say, yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I, I don't know. The others are derivatives I, that might be true. I'm not, I'm not here to have dishonest arguments. Uh, I asked really simply, if a book was written first, does that mean it's true? And you did some really strange left turn there where if the books all mention Jesus, then yes. Okay. You, you are factually, fundamentally, logically wrong because the fact that a book was written first tells you nothing at all about whether it's true. Well, James is quoting the Sermon on the Mount in his epistle when he says, let your yes be yes and no mean no. All right, my no is no. Next. <laughs> Sorry, I really wanted you to jump in on that, but we kept going down well, my, my field. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A minefield of my field. Yeah. I mean, he's he's just so in love with this material. He He needs to step back and say, you know... <laughs> What, what does it all mean? Is there anything of value here? Yeah. If you begin by assuming that the book is true or the book is relating true information, then you're going to find things that you believe. Just like yesterday, somebody began a conversation with me by assuming that I was a misogynistic man trying to argue with a woman because women were too stupid or wouldn't re reply. That was literally her first response to me disagreeing. Um, none of that is true. She's, she was like, oh, I see that you've only responded to women in this thread. Well, no, actually, I only responded to you in this thread, and I haven't made any assumptions at all about whether or not you're a woman or anything at all about whether or not either of our genders matter at all. You just said an answer, and I said you were wrong, and then you came at me as if, as if uh, I was uh, a misogynist out to real, you know, steamroll over a woman. Uh, that's not relevant. That same thing happens when you get so close to something that you color everything you read with your own bias. And if you begin with, oh, well, it's got to be true, then you're going to find that. And if you begin with, oh, anybody who comes in and just says I'm wrong is clearly a man looking to push a woman around, right. then that's what you're going to see too. Bias. Yeah. yeah. Hey, let's check in on our uh, Shelly Siegel challenge. I will, actually. Uh, Jason from Alabama just bought two tickets from the show and emailed them. They're to be donated uh, to whoever Don and I wish. So thank you, Jason. I think they've been donated already. And uh, there's, there's, there's three total? There's three, three. Tic three tickets sold so far, so we will end the show at 6.03. Okay. See how this is going? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, do, we do appreciate the, the support and the interest and everything else, and we'll keep you posted throughout the show. And thank you so much to uh, Jason in Alabama. Yes, very much. Uh, who would you like to go to next? We have nothing but theists on the, on the line. That's awesome. Um, how about uh, number two? All right. Davis in Toronto, thanks for waiting. You're looking to defend against atheist claims about slavery in the <clears throat> Bible. Uh, That's for, right. For the record... Uh, the claims about slavery in the Bible aren't atheist. Uh, sorry, I think I got the phrasing wrong. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Not in my position. But first up, thanks a lot for having me on the show. I'm a big fan, uh, and I really like what you guys do, so thanks a lot for that. Thanks. So there seems to be some kind of garbling with your mic or your cell phone or whatever, so just please be patient. It may be hard to understand you on occasion. Certainly, no problem. Is it better now? Yes. Okay, good. So what I wanted to do was uh, talk uh, or defend against 
uh, claims that the Bible is in favor of slavery, or at least in some kind of traditional interpretation of that. Uh, so yes, there's. Have a you lot got a Bible handy? Because <laughs> uh, I do. The Bible does. It outlines a lot of rules. Yeah, how I, to treat slaves. I, I actually have and I, a Bible uh, right here. So, I mean, we could maybe go through it together because when I did my video on slavery, that's all I did was point out what the Bible actually says. So let's... No, I, I completely agree with you, and I agree that slavery is wrong politically. But politically? Slavery exists, it exists metaphysically. And what I mean by that is you can be a slave in today, even today's Western society. Yeah, I'm not talking about well. metaphoric slavery. I'm talking about actually owning people's property, which is what the Bible advocates. Okay, fair enough. But slavery exists. Uh, it, it exists regardless of what the politics of the day are. Okay, like it exists. You can exist as wage slavery. Davis, you can exist as slavery Davis, your own addiction. Davis. Mm -hmm. None of that. Okay, none of this is remotely relevant. Does the Bible, in Exodus twenty-one and other places, advocate for the permissibility of owning people as property and beating them as long as they don't die within a couple of days? Yes, yes. Then, then what difference does it make if in the modern world you might be a metaphorical wage slave? That is a completely irrelevant thing when we are talking about what the Bible supports. Uh, no, it, it isn't, because what the Bible recognizes is that no matter what the political reality is, no matter what, how, if you outlaw slavery or not, it's going to exist. Bullshit. And you need to Bullshit. channel it. Bullshit. Bullshit. This is, this is the most embarrassing apologetic I've ever heard on this, okay? Does the Bible allow people to own slaves as property, pass them on to their kids, beat them as long as they don't die within a couple days, and does it have special rules for what you do with Hebrew slaves versus your non-Hebrew slaves? Yes or no? Yes. Have we not outlawed yeah. that form of slavery? Oh, uh, yes, we have. So, when you say that it'll always be around and can't be outlawed, that's not true. Would you well, like to you start over? There's, well, what I'm trying to get at, uh, Matt, is that you will always have servitude or slavery or indentured. I don't give a shit. If you were God, would you ever include a passage that says it's okay to own people as property? Well, it depends on if I'm appealing to politics or uh Something deeper than that. Uh, wait, wait. He was Did a slave not to politics, hear, apparently. <laughs> God, God, God is appealing to politics? God isn't making proclamations about morality? Yes. He was being PC. Morality, yes. Yeah, you have a weak-ass God. I'm moving on. <laughs> if your God can be trumped by Trump, you have a weak-ass God. <laughs> Next. Yeah, not worth worshiping, is it? Yeah. It, Oh, well, the Bible, yes, it advocates for slavery, which means the Bible's advocating for something that you think is immoral and you think God thinks is immoral, and your excuse is that God needed to kowtow to political perceptions at the time. And yet it was okay for God to tell you not to eat shrimp and not to wear fabrics of mixed clothing, and that if a man lies with another man as he lies with a woman, they've committed an abomination. Wow, you've got a God that's selectively strong against homosexuals and shellfish, but is fine with people being owned as property for thousands of years before he bothers to, oh, wait, no, 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 he didn't bother to correct it when Jesus comes down and takes over. Jesus didn't say, hey, you know that stuff you guys said about slavery? That was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. You got something wrong in your Bible. That never happened. Where's Bible part three? Where's the newest update that says, you know what? Not only was the Old Testament wrong about slavery, but Jesus and Paul were wrong about slavery too. We don't know how we screwed that up, but we did. We'd like to fix that now. Has it even been corrected in the in the Quran or the Book of Mormon, has it? No. Your devotion, <laughs> your devotion to your religion, I am sorry to say, makes you look stupid. When you bend over backwards to try to make excuses for immorality, you are sacrificing your humanity. You are putting yourself in a morally inferior position, and you're doing it primarily because you cannot acknowledge that your holy book got something wrong. Even when the last caller acknowledged that the holy book got something wrong, where did we go? We went on a Jordan Peterson extravaganza about metaphoric slavery and wage slaves. Well, that's bullshit. The question is, is the Bible a good book to inform people about the morality of certain issues, including slavery? And the answer is no. 
It's the one and only correct answer. And as long as you keep trying to make excuses for it, I'll keep batting you around like a cat toy and sending you on your way so that the next apologist can call in and somebody someday might actually be honest about this and say, yeah, I think the Bible is wrong, as Ray Comfort did when he said that he didn't believe everything that was in the Bible, because Ray, while many people just consider him to be an idiot, was at least smart enough not to go down the I'm going to make excuses for slavery route, one of the easiest things to avoid doing. I don't know. <laughs> it's... It's sad. Yep. Yep. And, and, and to think that for the bulk of my life, um, I was in that mindset. Yeah, yeah. The problem or the difference, I suppose, is when I came up and realized that here's a passage where the Bible is absolutely advocating for something that is clearly immoral, then anyone with any sense can see is immoral. Instead of saying oh, well, God is mysterious, or God, maybe God had to talk to those people that way and he was trying to soften slavery and make it nicer so that eventually it would get better. Because, you know, you can't ever really... Out, I, I don't think I ever went down that. I, yeah. I, I am too honest in the sense that I went, wow, that's clearly wrong. And if that's wrong and what it's in the Bible, wrong? what else is wrong? Yeah. Which gets us back to the first caller. I, I had a friend who just, who just rationalized it by saying, I don't understand. Yeah. And shut off her brain which is just sad. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, it's fine to say you don't understand. It's just that once you've acknowledged you don't understand, you don't have an answer, don't pretend that you do. Don't try to start making excuses for something. I don't know, but maybe. I don't know, but maybe. Okay, but maybe does not a solid foundation for a religious belief make. <laughs> Mike in San Jose, California, thanks for waiting. No problem. Hey, what's up, guys? Hi. Just talking about stuff. Cool. Um, so the reason I called in was, you know, I called in before, talked to Matt and Tracy, um, got hung up on, like, the most of uh, the theists on here. But yeah. uh, hopefully that w won't happen to me so soon. Well, I'll, uh, let, this time. I'll let Don answer and decide when to hang up. <laughs> Is that fair? <laughs> fair enough. Much power. Um <laughs> So really what I, what I want to talk about is I want to set forth an argument that atheism is a lie. How can, how can something that doesn't make a positive claim be a lie? Sorry, I was going to let okay, Don let talk. Me, oh, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me explain. Um, so so you, the first you, thing do, I wanna... you do realize that we define atheism as a lack of belief in gods? Uh, yes, Yes, yeah, I so I'm, I'm not convinced a God exists, just like I'm not convinced fairies exist. Until you can come up yes. with a way that both of those things are lies. I, because it, I, I'm sitting here, and I honestly don't believe a God exists, and I honestly don't believe fairies exist, and yet you're saying I'm lying. So we, we presume um, that we're experts about this, the state of our minds, right? And Correct. Yeah. So are you, are you saying I, I don't understand, I, I can't, fathom my own beliefs and, and express them? Is, let is let that... me explain it this way. Okay. Let me explain it this way. So um, first we have to both agree on our definitions. Um, so atheism is the lack of belief in a God and or the disbelief of a God. Mm -hmm. And theism is the belief or having faith in God, right? Um, Basically, faith, if, you, if it, you're convinced a God exists, you're a theist. If not, you're an atheist. But your, your definitions yeah. are fine. Yeah. Go ahead. Faith is something where you're uh, accepting the proposition as true without evidence, correct? I'm fine with that definition of faith. I, I tended to define it as faith is the reason people give for believing something when they don't have a good reason. Okay, it's more or less kind of the same thing. It's, uh, yeah, a valid reason, a, a valid form of evidence. I would say sound, um, but okay. Where, Whereas disbelief is the assumption or the rejection of a claim uh, or the assumption of the, of, of the claim being wrong. No, it's um, not. Dis disbelief is not assuming you're wrong. It's not being convinced that you're right. It's essentially the difference between uh, a jury not being convinced of guilt and a jury being convinced of innocence. Those are two different things. Yet the jury is not convinced uh, with, with or without evidence. They... The default, so your theists are saying God is guilty of existing. Hello? 
Nobody can really know if God exists. Okay, then well, if, if, if nobody can really know if God exists, then this conversation is useless, right? Because you can't know and I can't know. And all I'm saying is I'm not convinced that you're correct, which means of the two of us, I'm the only one that's close to being possibly right. Because you can't demonstrate your case and all my position is, is that you can't demonstrate your case, which means not only am I not lying, I'm completely correct. Sorry, Don was going to answer that. <laughs> oh, we lost him. We lost him? He, he, he ran away. Uh-oh. Uh, or just got disconnected. That's, that's the way things go. Yeah, well, he's welcome to call back and sure. we can continue. I'll, I'll let you go with Gavin in Vancouver. Thanks for waiting. You're on with Don. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Hi, so after watching your show, what I've been struck by, I guess, is like, um, like your criticisms of Christianity and Judaism are sort of not lining up with, I don't know. My approach. Um, so, so, so let me just try to describe how I, how I have come to to Christianity. Like, um, because like for twenty years, like I was never raised in a Christian framework. But you, you came to Christianity as an adult. Yeah. Okay. Right. And um, so I'm like highly imaginative, like in a lot of ways, like, I don't know if you have the sense, but like, I, like, do you ever have like strong dreams that are very meaningful to you? Like maybe? Sure, but I put them in the category of dreams, right? Right, and so. And, and I don't, I by the way. You don't? Okay. <laughs> okay. How does that work? <clears throat> like I don't know how it works. I just I don't hardly ever remember my dreams. I don't have dreams that have any particular significance for me. Um, I was just answering the question. You you were like, Do you ever have well, I, dreams that I have had, significance? I don't have dreams that were kind of you know, sort of seemed like they were trying to tell me a message and uh and, uh, you know, I view that as sort of my own psyche, you know, confabulating things that uh, maybe uh, can <clears throat> rage to the conscious level of consciousness and and be noticed at that level. Uh, I mean, when I was a kid, I remember having dreams that terrified me that I would view as getting a message even from God. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was a believer then. And what I'm saying is that in my entire adult life and going back to probably at the age of 14... I cannot recall an instance where I ever had a dream that I remembered and thought was significant in any way. In part because I put them in the context of dreams, but also in part because I just don't tend to remember them when I wake up. Mm. Right. And, and so I've been, like, just for context, my approach to religion is like, like I, believe, I believe that natural law, like you don't need any miracles. Everything in the world that happens is all just natural law. But my approach to religion is it organizes this sort of dream stuff. And it's very important. Like, I feel like there's just different types of people. Some people are not, they don't have this. But for me, like, there's this point in my life where it's just completely lost. And it's like the nightmares were starting to come into my waking experience but when I read the Bible it just organized everything and I stopped having nightmares and like I've just been trying to understand that and I don't know, do, do you make anything of that or well because you know um, I think you could have picked up <clears throat> all sorts of different books and and been led in that state to uh, another place 
and, and maybe read more significance into it than maybe it deserved. Um, clearly, clearly, the Bible resonates with people, and there are stories within it that that many people find meaning in. And um, you know, it's it's sort of withstood the test of time, I think, in, in many respects. Um, not all of it, and and that uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It, it just may mean that uh, you know, as a as a work. Uh, from humans, it it captures some of the some of the aspects of being human. So, there are people who now identify as Jedi's because Star Wars resonated particularly strongly with them. Um, there are people who spend a great deal of time figuring out whether they're Gryffindor or Hufflepuff <laughs> because Harry Potter resonated with them. The thing about books, it, whether it's a fiction book or a religious text, uh, fiction books are intentionally designed to uh, impact people, to to relate stories in a way that is entertaining and and may have significance for them. For uh, a collection of books like the Bible, you have a mix of history and a mix of poetry and song, and it's completely unsurprising to me that someone uh, could read parts of or all of the Bible from a position where they are uh, confused and floundering and not quite sure about, you know, life and and maybe these anxieties are playing themselves out in dreams. And then once it gives you this uh, apparent answer, uh, I can understand how that can be impactful for people because it's really uncomfortable to not know things. And one of the things that the Bible and other books do is make you think you know things when you don't. Uh, why is there something rather than nothing? Because that's what God wanted. Why is this moral and this is immoral? Because that's what God wanted. It, it, it feels like an answer that makes it easier to deal with the fact that you didn't have an answer before. But like Don was saying, that's independent. Whether or not a book impacted you enough to ease your nightmares and make you feel more confident uh, and comfortable is independent from whether or not what the book says is true. Right. I'm wondering if you've studied uh, Carl Jung. A bit. Yeah. And I, I haven't. I know of him, but I, I haven't studied his, his work. Yeah, well, a lot of my approach comes from, like, he was really onto something, and I highly recommend it, but... So this is the idea of the collective unconscious? Uh, well, but he studied a lot of that um, I think Carl Jung had this idea that people are dreaming all the time and when you're awake, reality is stronger in some way. And this kind of resonates with me because like when I, like I've studied Judaism, I've studied Christianity, when you study these things and start to engage, you can kind of feel how they change the way you see the world. And it's really interesting to go through different... But, but I think that Christianity is not special in that way. I, I, th I think you could find that experience in, in lots of places. Even if it was. Right. Even if the Christian Bible had a, a, a more impactful uh, effect on more people, that's about how people relate to these stories. That's not about... How, whether or not the stories are telling us something true. Uh, the fact that you right. can find meaning or value in something doesn't mean that you've discovered some yeah. truth. Yeah, so we're, right. we're pretty big on, uh, you know, empiricism and, and uh, you know, what is, what is reality and these sorts of things. And I think you can come, come at uh, what is meaningful to you, what, what gives you comfort, these sorts of questions. And we may not be, you know, we, we, <laughs> the reality uh, that we are embrace may or may not be as, as pretty as, as, as we might like or as, uh, as warm and fuzzy. Um, but, you know, I would rather be sort of in touch with the reality than, than give too much credence to a fantasy. Uh, okay. 
Um, I think that's all I really okay. wanted to go through. So, okay. And I'm sorry. Sorry we didn't didn't sort of uh, connect that well with this conversation. So take care. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mike, who was on, got disconnected and is back. Uh, so there we go. You there, Mike? Yep, I'm on still here. Thanks for uh, having me back on. Yeah, we Sorry. didn't hang up uh, on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I realize it was uh, probably my reception. Can you uh, so here, maybe in one up. sentence recap where we were so we can pick up again? So I want to make the argument that atheism is a lie. Just to uh, run through the definitions again, we went through theism, we went through atheism, we went through belief and disbelief, we went through faith, and we were just about to go through knowing. I think there's something else I we should think. define. Yes. A lie. Because to me, yes. if somebody, uh, if I want to say that's a lie, then it needs to be a, a declarative statement. And in particular, it needs to be not just a declarative statement which is false, but which is knowingly false. There needs to be some intent to deceive. Okay. It has to be knowingly false. There has to be an intention to be deceptive, pretending, acting, hypocrisy. How, how would, would hypocrisy fall into that? I think there are category? ways to dem Intent is difficult because we're talking about what's in somebody's mind. I think there are ways to demonstrate intent through the things that you talked about, like hypocrisy. But what is the declarative statement that you're saying is a lie? I'm saying that atheism in and of itself as an ideology is a lie. Okay, atheism... So no, stop. Atheism is not a declarative statement, so it cannot be a lie. So we need to know what the declarative statement is that you think is a lie. Um, you say atheism is not a declarative statement. Correct. Perhaps you, you're saying you're saying that it's uh, more of a a label or a uh, a term that we've put used to categorize people. Even, is that what you're saying? No. Even if you went to what is the atheist position? My position as an atheist is that theism has not met its burden of proof, and therefore I am unconvinced. That's it. So you could go a number of places from here. It's like okay, well you're you're ignoring evidence. Okay. You're willfully ignoring evidence, that might be a way. Or you secretly uh, go in the closet at night and believe in God, and, and during the day you're, you're yes. you know, presenting another yeah. case. Wh wh which of those two, are, am, I, am I getting close to it's, where you're coming from? It's, it's a little bit different. So my idea is that if we accept the premise that no one has evidence if God exists or not, and we accept the premise Then that you could never no conclude that atheism is a lie. Because if you, well, well, this is what I was acknowledging when you got disconnected. If your position is that no one can demonstrate with evidence whether or not a God exists, then there's no way for anyone to come down on either side of that, which means you couldn't possibly demonstrate that it's one, either of them is a lie. Except that we have in practice that believers, by the definition of their name, they don't actually assert to know if God exists. I don't care. You may I don't care. This isn't about knowledge. It's a question about belief and reasonableness. So theists believe there's a God. I don't care if they claim to know it. Atheists do not believe in a God. They don't claim to know that there is no God. So, so they, but still, believers have a faith in God, which is the assumption that there is no evidence to begin with. So they're not asserting knowledge. In yes, they believe they something faith without faith. good reason. We've established that that's faith. Whereas, at the other hand, we have atheists who claim they disbelieve that God exists, but their disbelief is actually based on the assumption that they understand what valid evidence for God would be, yes. and they assert that this, there is a lack of this valid evidence, or that there's even contradictory valid evidence to uh, establish their belief or no. their disbelief, rather. No. So this, is, this gets to the question of when people ask me, what would convince you that God exists? I have a stock answer that, that, is, that I've used for years now, but it's changed because I have no idea. I am not pretending to know what it would take to demonstrate that a God exists just that it hasn't happened. I don't need to know what evidence would prove string theory, just that it hasn't happened. I don't need to know what evidence would prove a God exists, but if there is a God, that God absolutely should know what evidence should convince people and has not presented it, and therefore either that God does not exist or that God does not want people to know he exists yet. This is not about 
I'm not in any way assuming I know what evidence would prove a God and that evidence hasn't shown up. I'm saying I have no idea what evidence would prove a God. But if it shows up, it will be recognizable as evidence for it. Just like I don't know what evidence would prove that fairies are, are real. But as soon as that evidence is presented in, in a sufficiently reliable context to which it would warrant belief in, in fairies, then I'm going to believe in fairies. But I don't know what that evidence would be. And in a God sense, it would be monumentally arrogant for me to assume that I know what that evidence would be. The real problem here is that there are countless people running around saying, hey, we've got evidence for God. And then people like me are saying, oh, really? What is it? And when they present the evidence, yeah. it's not. But, but this is the problem with, with that position, even though I agree with you uh, probably 95% of the way. Well, good. Um, the problem with that in the end is that we agree that no one has evidence for God. No one can really know if God exists. Everybody in the end has to believe or disbelieve. So in this kind of dichotomy where knowledge isn't really an option, then, then you're, you're faced with a little bit of a different proposition. Cause yes, you either gonna, claim that you have it. good reason to believe something or you exercise faith. Yes, exactly. And if, if, if what you said is true, the latter about God is true, what you said was that God doesn't want everyone to know that he exists. Okay. Which if that's true, if that's true... Then, then every believer, probably, every believer is by definition unwarranted in their belief because if God doesn't want people to know he exists, then they cannot possibly have a justified position. Well, they, well, if God doesn't want everyone to know he Correct. exists, that's true. But if he wants a select few people to know, not everybody, yes. but just a few. His I completely is agree. Right. But if there's a God that's going around selectively revealing himself to people, those people are the only ones that could possibly have evidentiary warrant. They cannot demonstrate it to anybody else. And it doesn't make a shit's bit of difference to me because until I'm presented with that evidence, I am holding the only rational position that I can hold, and it's not a lie. I, I, I understand your position. I do understand that, but... How am I lying, then? Well, the, the idea of atheism being a disbelief based on valid evidence or the lack of evidence assuming that you know that there is evidence for god or anybody has evidence that in itself is a lie what no 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 you don't get to keep carrying on a television show for 20 years begging people to give us evidence please give us some evidence so you don't get to just call something a lie i mean you can well let me ask you this well let me ask you this what's what what's better to be arrogant or be ignorant Arrogant. If you had to choose one. Arrogant would be better than ignorant. That's the thing. Like, the theist would choose ignorance. I, I'm very well ignorant. aware of that. <laughs> Voluntarily yeah. choosing it through an exercise of faith and then calling in to say that atheists are lying and having no demonstration that we're lying. <laughs> is it arrogant to say that we don't ignorance. know? But also, by the way, arrogance versus ignorance is a false dichotomy because there's monumentally fuck tons of people who are incredibly ignorant and very arrogant about it. The difference is they can't they cannot they have not met their burden of proof. It's not it's not a lie for me to say you have not convinced me. It's not a lie for me to say I've evaluated all of the arguments for the existence of God that have been presented that I've found and, and explored. And, and also found them wanting. It's not a lie for me to say that if, in fact, there was a sound argument supported by evidence for the existence of God, it would be on the front page of every newspaper. It would be the only thing people were talking about on TV. It would be a Nobel Prize. It would have every organization giving that. The fact that that hasn't happened is the demonstration that theism has not met its burden of proof. And under no circumstance is a rejection of a bald assertion rooted in faith with a declaration from you that nobody can have evidence for this. In no way is that ever a lie to say, I don't believe you. Okay, I, I guess from your perspective, I do understand your position. You're, you're I bet money you don't. Perspective that, that atheism is a response to the theistic claim, um, not a response to God's existence itself, but to the theistic claim. So if, in that... No, no. Yeah, if, mankind if has right. invented 20,000 gods. Are, 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 I'm not quite sure which one you're talking about. 
Well, I'm particularly I'm t- probably well, I'm a Christian, so I'm talking about the Christian God in general. Um, okay. You, I'm curious. Have how you, is have the you killed Christian, any witches? How is the Christian God for which we don't have evidence for distinguishable from a Hindu God that we don't have evidence for? This is the thing. So, just as somebody who does, who has had, yes, his own little bit of evidence to give me enough faith to believe in God, um, this is the thing. You cannot get that evidence without starting to believe first. Yeah, that's called self-deception, and it in no way answers the question that I just asked. To say that you need to believe first in order to get the evidence is exactly the recipe for self-deception. That's a con game. What I asked was, how is the Christian God for which you think there is no evidence distinguishable from a Hindu God that you have no evidence for? That's kind of a loaded question. You bet. I, you can't. I can't really. I can't really answer that because um, the Hindu God and the Christian God might be the same. It depends on who that Hindu and that. No, no, no. They're not the right. same. They're, how? how what? What kind of fucking Christian could possibly claim that the Christian God and the Hindu God might be the same? Do, what do you know? I, I, this is this is the most bizarre version of Christianity I've ever heard. To say my God might be the same as the Hindu God. Really? Well, the Christian. The Christian God is the creator of the universe and everything in it. So therefore, the Christian God is really the God of everyone. It's whether or not that individual person acknowledges that or not. It's not really, is the Hindu God or the Christian God. There are many Hindu gods. So you're basically saying Ganesh and Jesus could be the same. uh, I, and the Holy Ghost I, I and the know. flying spaghetti I, monster. I, I'm saying I, I, I can't I can't I can't speak as far as the Hindu God. I all I understand is that there's one God and that one God that that monotheism kind and, of. And how do you know that? All, all religions. Well, it's kind of a faith. The the idea that that life comes from a singular cause, or that everything. Sorry, not just life, but everything I, I thought you said we couldn't have cause. evidence, and this was a faith thing. Why are you talking about life now? Well, we, we can have evidence. Oh, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. You <laughs> I'm said confused. <laughs> nobody could have evidence for or against this. Oh, okay. What I meant was definitive, valid evidence so as to... Okay, first of all, evidence is... Describe ev- knowledge. Stop using the word valid. It has a very particular usage in logic, and what you're talking about is evidence, which was, is what makes a premise sound or not. Valid goes to the structure of the argument. Not that you would know well, that either. Technical, the, technical the, term. The for validity valid. of the evidence. Not, not in logical terms. Sure, I'm just talking sure. about the validity. Okay, colloquially, of the, the validity of the evidence. Um, so now you think that there is evidence, good evidence, for God, when before not, you said there wasn't. Not definitive. So there's the difference between okay. belief and knowledge, right? Knowledge. No, 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 fucking no. <laughs> we want this great I evidence. <laughs> already set aside the notion of knowledge. It's irrelevant. Belief is either warranted or it is not. And if you think that there is evidence for, when you say not definitive evidence, to me that sounds like you're saying not sufficient evidence to warrant belief. No, I'm saying not sufficient evidence to warrant knowledge. But, there, you know, belief, you don't have to have, you know, definitive knowledge. It just has to be beyond so a reasonable... Instead of having the oh, no, no. conversation, why don't we have the conversation and give us give us the damn evidence? There we go. <laughs> you're, you're going with beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? Beyond a reasonable doubt, yes. Sure. So at let's least, set up a, let's set up a courtroom where God is accused of existing, and you need to demonstrate that beyond a reasonable doubt. Go. First, produce the defendant. <laughs> 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 I, need to, I need to demonstrate that to myself, right? You need to demonstrate that, that might it. might be a starting point. So reasonableness <laughs> is not just a personal fucking opinion. Reasonableness is demonstrated. Now, you're, everybody's going to have a slightly different standard about how much evidence is required for various things. Extraordinary evidence or extraordinary claims are going to require extraordinary evidence. Uh, if Don tells me that he just got a new pet poodle... Uh, I'm going to take him at his word for a number of reasons. One, because I know that poodles exist and people have them as pets. Uh, I trust Don because he has no reason to lie about it. Uh, I understand I live in a world where this sort of thing happens. And if it turns out that Don is lying to me, then I will change my mind. And then I know something new about Don and that he will lie about having a pet. But having a pet poodle is in a completely different category from 
there is a being that exists inside and outside of space-time who is the creator of the universe who came down and took human form in order to sacrifice himself to himself so that we can have salvation from what he was going to do to us if we don't accept this. And it's completely obsessed about your sex life. Yes. Now, yes. So if, the if, evidence, yeah, the if, evidence if, for that claim would need to be vastly stronger than, hey, somebody told me a story. Hey, somebody wrote something down in a book. Or, hey, I had a feeling. Do, do you have any physical evidence for anybody ever rising from the dead apart from in a hospital where their heart is stopped and they're resuscitated because death is a process? Find somebody that's been dead for a day and a half and they rise that's again. Kind of, that's kind of the thing. If we have evidence that's demonstrable to everybody else, then that kind of goes against the whole idea that God does not want everyone to know. He just wants a select few to know. Okay, then so, God's a dick. It, I, I got to go. We, we are two, minute, <laughs> we are two minutes okay, over sorry. where I said it was going to yeah, end we'll the show. Talk next time. Yep. Sure. Uh, yeah, if your God is selectively revealing himself to people, uh, first of all, he's a dick. Um, uh, you know, but if it's basically you're calling to say that I'm a liar because you think that your God either has revealed itself to me such that I'm being dishonest or you'll say that God hasn't revealed himself to me yet, which means I'm not a liar. But at the end of the day, if you are making a claim that a God exists, that is a claim that could be true or not true, and you may be lying or not lying. But to say, I don't believe you, that's not a statement that, I mean, it is true or not true, but you don't have any way to get in my head to say, you really do believe me. And don't get me wrong, I don't think Mark is actually doing that, but it is something that theists have done. I remember Cy Ten Bruggenkate basically in every presuppositionalist claiming that, oh, not only does Matt believe that God exists, Matt knows that God exists. Everybody knows it. You're without excuse. Well, now, it's congratulations. So, so insulting. You, you've done a really good job of telling me that you think you're right and you think you cannot be wrong. That is a conversation ender because I'm not convinced that you're right and I'm acknowledging that I might be wrong. And whether you categorize that as arrogant or not, it's not ignorant. <laughs> it's not arrogant either. I don't think so, but it can okay. be. I don't, I don't mind. If people want to think I'm arrogant, fine. I tell you what, they, they're like, oh, Einstein believed in God. Well, Einstein evidently believed in dowsing too. Am I smarter than Einstein? On God and dowsing, yes. On other subjects, perhaps not. Well, Isaac Newton believed in God. Yeah, and he tried to turn lead into gold. So there's clearly some front where I'm smarter than Isaac Newton. And how sad would it be if we weren't smarter than people from the past? But I'm smarter than your God. <laughs> I don't care what religion you are. Pick out your God. Grab your holy book. I'm smarter than that motherfucker. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> there's no bit of wisdom, of knowledge that has improved the world that has come solely from a religion. It would all need to be verified scientifically. It's a useless proposition. And when you look at all these gods and their petty little concerns over who's doing what with whose genitalia and whether or not you subs uh, become subservient and bow down and whether or not we slaughter animals and burn them so that the smoke and the blood filters up to his nose and makes him, <laughs> makes him happy, a collection of foreskins, all these other things. Oh, but God moves in mysterious ways. No, he doesn't. He doesn't do anything in any ways as far as any of us are concerned. And you don't just get to say that we're lying. You got to actually come with something. And if you come with, nobody has evidence. It's all just faith. And then you flip to, but I think I got evidence that could be beyond a reasonable doubt, you already lost. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. There's a crew in the other room over there. They don't have a camera up today. <laughs> People on the other side of the glass. Do not forget this Thursday, Shelly Siegel in concert along with Secular Sexuality. You can go to bit.ly slash Secular Sexuality uh, and a few other ways to find those links as well. Thanks for everybody who bought tickets, and uh, we're out of here. Okay. Make this Valentine's Day one to remember. It's time to get sexy. Live in Austin, Texas, 
and intimate performance by recording artist Shelley Siegel follows a live taping of Secular Sexuality. Food is included and drinks will be available for purchase. Get your tickets now by going to eventbrite.com and search for Secular Sexuality. That's eventbrite.com, search Secular Sexuality. 